Check one, two. Hey, what's up, internet? It's Chris Krug. I'm here with my buddy, Charlie Smith. Hey, Charlie, how's it going, bud? Oh, great, man. It's good to see you, brother. Yeah. In a think, minute. Yeah, it's true. I caught up with you last, I think, when I was down in Miami, Florida. But um, yeah, look at you. You're looking healthy and happy, my friend. I'm trying to keep, I'm trying to catch up. <laughs> I'm on strike on the razor. I'm, at, I'm on razor strike. The trick is, man, you just got to sit back and let it grow. And then like when you're like, ah, shit, I'm ugly. I got to change something up. Don't. That's the truth. Don't cut it. Yeah. Charlie hit me up this morning. He saw that Bernie Man video that I put out yesterday where I was just sharing some of the stories that were trapped in my head and my heart about how I ended up at Bernie Man and the cool things that I got to participate in. And the first story there was Uncle Charlie and his red hot cock. So Charlie hit me up and said, hey, dude, let's talk. And I said, that would be awesome. And here we are. Glad to be here. I'm really excited about your chapter that you're opening up this whole effort to connect individuals and bring the stories to reality and share the mythology of the now. That's what it's all. It's what we're in. Man, <laughs> thanks for teeing it up like that. You know, um, I got a call today from Bernie Man, from a friend who works for Bernie Man, and they saw the video about you and I gave yesterday and stuff, and they're like, dude, awesome video. Some of those stories don't exist in the world yet. Super stoked you uh, put it out there. And then she said, but I noticed twice in that video, you asked people to like follow along and share it and uh, help you out and grow the audience or whatever. And she's like, what's up with that? Why are you asking for that? Like she said... Uh, I want to help you and stuff, but you just really haven't talked too much about like, why are you trying to grow this? I know it's not for like its own sake or whatever. So what the fuck, KK? And, uh, and it gave me pause. For a yeah, man, it gave me pause for a second. Cause she was like, like the video made it into the right person's hands. They watched it. They had some questions and they called me and that was like, I, that's engagement, man. And so I was like, Trish, what am I really trying to do? And I was like, Yo, I just think I got like a unique perspective on this intersection of like future tech and art and online community. And I'm trying to share that with the world because I've been told that it, it inspires people or frees their mind or helps them think about things differently. And so while it's not growth for growth's sake, yeah, I'm trying to make it bigger so I can talk to more people and like in, learn in public with more people around and stuff. And so anyway... I've recorded a podcast this morning a little bit more about the why I'm doing all this. That's pretty cool. I think that <laughs> now's the time to open up the doorway of the mind and the experience that's out there and going on right now. And uh, there's not a real platform in the now. There, there are a lot of superimposed preconceived platforms that are out there with the regular news. But that that's just something that is about I, the thing that I can see happening is this evolution of storytelling about from the and incorporating the actual artist's visions and, and the drive that makes them who they are and what they bring to the platform more understandable to those who may not quite understand the artist's mind or the creative thinker's mind and even the creative thinker needs a reflecting mechanism and a sounding board to develop themselves and community as i, I is so important that in the with this isolation that we've been there over the past yeah. five trying yeah. to break old Trying to reconnect has been really fucking hard. It's ruined so many beautiful relationships. It sent people down the rabbit hole to self-destruction. And it's also elevated people to new levels of understandings about themselves and what they can really do and who they really all are. And this is like this thing that I see that you're reaching for to for self-realization. And opening a conduit for self-expression so we can have this voice, a, a rejoining of voices and understanding, you know, the art experience and encounters 
of the 15th come. Oh. Yeah, man. You've scratched the surface of a bunch of things that are like really near and dear to my heart around community and art and the intersection of technology and kind of our own place in the world coming out of this pandemic and stuff. And so I do want to dive deeper into some of that, but for sure, like in two minutes, but I do want to just by way of introduction, let people know who you are. Charlie's one of the crazy old uncles of Bernie man. Maybe I'll give a little intro and then you can tell me where I'm wrong and give your own. But Charlie's been making huge metal sculptural art at Burning Man for over 20 years. His Some of his most famous pieces are... Horror. The teary, oh, the Klebel uh, Flobbler. The Now Sabine Puffus Man. Red Hot Cock. What, what about that big metal Buddha thing, the Ganesha or whatever? Infinite Infant and the Trail of Toys. Yeah. There, then I took some years of Johnny Apple CD regional development of Burning Man in the early 2000s when it was starting and made it my business from my own funding and funding from small groups to travel around between the communities, bringing artwork that has a vibe that's open minded and about, about community. And the transformational fire, and man, Charlie's work is off the chart. It's huge. It's made of metal. It's often on fire and integrates other flaming components to it. It is built by teams of people. You're talking about community. We, you and I, worked on the Red Hot Cock together, and um, I got to join you once we were already on our way to Burning Man. But you spent the year before that, I think, hosting. Open fabrication workshops. Yeah, or was like, seen a lot of community. Hey guys, what's going on? Uh, my son is one of his friends are walking. What's up, Casper? Um, I'm on a, oh, right here. This is my son, Casper. And his, hey, there's Casper. What's up, Casper? And uh, he's got his buddy Carlos here. An internship. And learning, learning a little at about it like part of my like, the way that i build artwork and the way that i format it um actually utilizing the community and bringing the art into the community to actually be con constructed from the wrong resources right into the finish and so i do community workshops where people come in of all skill levels to put forth effort into expanding their minds, expanding their relationships, and taking away an experience that they become part of the artwork forever. As long as the piece exists, their energy is in that. They learn how to weld, fabricate, and they learn about each other and sharing this experience and one of the biggest pieces that was one of the largest exercises that was in 2005 was a synapsis project that was done with jamie with the mother of my children mm -hmm. and we're not together anymore but we were together then and we created a magic six city six sculptures over six month run these community builds all over the country and Leaving the sculptures in those communities to use and take care of, and they were built in the community, and then they were brought to the fly on by those communities, and they all met each other in that circle of fire cauldrons, and they all got to tell the story because the communication was in a symbol system that they created themselves. So there was no, the only words were the expression between each other on that platform once they all met and the relationships of taking that whole country and wanting it up into one bundle created a huge amount of relationships and connections through the community of art and that is still resonating today because uh, uh, there, there's a, a high percentage of people that took part in that project that have accelerated into their own artists and their own teams and yeah. it and it showed yeah. format work ownership you know i kind of want to emphasize too 
Community is a pretty cheap word these days. I throw it around all the time. People talk about being community managers, online community, all this kind of stuff. But like legit, the type of community that Charlie's talking about is rich and deep and real. Uh, I've hardly ever known someone who so legitimately like coalesces community around them. This guy has an army of supporters locally in Atlanta that, as he said, he's risen up. He finds other artists, invests himself in them. They work together on stuff. I'm thinking about like Lil Joe. I'm thinking about Paperboy, both artists in their own right, but have come up, up with you as well on stuff. And being at Burning Man with you, man, was wild. Charlie's camp's called Ass Camp, which is pretty fitting. But uh, art, art, it, yeah, art, art and such art support services. And we were camped right down by Center Camp, and we had a nice bar there with the Glens and stuff. And um, I watched a steady flow of what seemed to be every interesting artist on the playa come pay their respects to Uncle Charlie pick his brain, find out what they're doing, have a bullshit, hang out. And uh, yeah, you really do have a rich group of people around you, man, that support you professionally, artistically. And I know beyond that as well, it's fucking inspiring, dude. It, 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 you know, it's, it, it's, it, it's kind of like, it, I don't know. I don't know how it all happens. It just does. And, yeah. and, and I, I, I put, I don't know. It, I guess it's like I've been in that community and I watched everybody grow from since 1998, my first inter interaction in the community. And I've missed three, I missed four years plus, I guess I missed five years and um, some of them from the pandemic. And um, I was there last year. I had plans for this year. I had to mail um, for medical reasons like that. I had a Tourette out of my eyes. And it just, it's not, I can't get that direct into that stressful environment right now. Yeah. I need to be able to see, I need to be able to hear myself continue to do the dream, which is to build art to like die and, and, and build a community that can transit across the, around the world. And I've been so lucky to be able to actually take work, build work in Cape Town. And, we did a project called Triple Bypass, and that was part of the BRAF, Burning Man Global Art Program. And we helped instigate at what's Africa Burns. Yeah, man. And, and, and that we went there with a project that was built in the studio in town over the course of six weeks. And it, we had the first Africa Burn in Cape Town, the Rogue Burn. And it was the first time community had a burning man represented artifact that was about how that thing is against other burning man in the world yes and you know, i spent a bunch of time in east africa in an art community but they don't are not tied to burning man and africa burns i'm talking about Raganzu bruno and arena and quizera my homeboys there in uh, in kampala uganda a couple of those guys are actually metal sculptors and fabricators as well and do big sculptural stuff. So we got to connect with my Uganda peeps, dude, and do a fucking metal on fire Africa burns meetup or something. I, Uganda should have its own festival that isn't even <laughs> uh, that for the, the pattern burning man is burning man and art is art and artists share their talents at Marine Band and as a platform of discussion that it's and it's a collision of genius minds. Dude. And, you you know, you'd, get a you'd get a trip out of my buddy Raganzu. His like claim to fame is he builds uh, playgrounds, children's playgrounds in like refugee camps and stuff like that. And he builds them out of like, industrial pla like, industrial garbage and stuff. Like I seen him build like a huge whale out of like, a million Nestle bottles that had been like mislabeled or misprinted or something like that. So they were just going to like throw them away. And he literally turns them into like amusement parks and freaking playgrounds and stuff in like some of the most stressful places in the world, man. And so I've got to go over there and work with him a bit. He's a real badass. And he lived 
in this bottle house that he built himself. So he acquired somehow 5,000 wine bottles or something and built himself a fucking house, a plaster and bottle house. The sun shines through so beautifully and a whole garden area and stuff around it too. That's really sweet. It's next level. It's no shanty town or nothing. And since I've left, we did a little fundraiser while I was there on my birthday. And we raised like $6,000 or something and left it behind. And he is now living in a bottle skyscraper, dude. He added two floors to to on top of his bottle house and staircases. And he does art residency programs there and stuff. And he is just another community guy, dude. That guy, he's an art teacher at a university. So he's had cohort after cohort of students come through his way and he pours himself into the ones that are able to receive it. And uh, yeah, so yeah. Raganzu, lots of love, my friend. We got to get you going with Uncle Charlie sometime. Maybe we come to Uganda. <laughs> love to you. I, I, my parenting days are loosening as my sons grow older. And I have I have been, I, my first and foremost thing is to bring my children, preacher into a good place. I've dedicated the last 17 years, not only doing what I do love but with artwork, but also bringing the future in that we have coming after us. And I totally, yeah, I, right now I have a, a, a group, I have a few young men and women that are coming to the studio to do internships that are looking for a, a, what can happen. They, they don't see what can happen. And being able to be an open platform and, and an elevation, a launching pad, so to speak, a possibility is to say, if I can do this and it can be done, it can be done. This is something that can be done. You have to just want to do it. And, and there's a way to find your will. And if you're really dedicated to your adventure in life you have every chance of making your dream come true in some format it doesn't happen overnight it takes a lot of work to get there and every experience that you have along the way you should take and learn from each one of them because i've done everything from being a janitor and a, 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 a changing beds and wiping windows and cleaning bathrooms working as a chef and working in, as a dishwasher but being and have been an assistant to a plumber and to an electrician and been part of building houses. I have a wide scope and then building sets for broadcast television elements for, um, for, for movies. And there's a wide variety. I never stayed in one ditch because I always look at life as a survey it says What's next, Charlie? I'm at a what's next, Charlie mode right now where I'm evolving into my next level of, I'm, getting, I'm not getting any younger, but I have a wealth of information to pass on yeah. to the future. Yeah. And I don't want that to go unlearned. And so I'm, I, um, I, I want to pass Hey, are you comfortable talking here a little bit about our recent connection around your sobriety journey and our sobriety journey a little bit? Yeah, I'm, I'm totally about that. Because I'd just like to say that while Charlie and I met in like the craziest of fun party environments, our lives have both kind of changed a little bit. And we've been able to reconnect in the last year or so as we, we go down that road together. So I just wanted to give you a little bit of chance to share where you're at and I might pipe in. And then specifically too, I want you to ultimately talk a little bit about some of the online communities that you've been participating in, because I think it's really novel and unique. Some of these drop-in meetings that you're doing and just uh, this support network that exists out there. Anyway, how are you feeling about all that stuff? I will tell you what, I, today is a very special day because it marks my two-year set sobriety mark for alcohol and drug abuse. And, um, uh, I've, I, I've spent the majority of my life self-medicating and partying, and I enjoyed a lot of that activity. I wouldn't be who I am without a lot of those passageways. I don't regret any of 
think I do regret some of the damage that was done to me and maybe some of the encounters that were had. Some heartbreaks and stuff. Heartbreak of hell is real. Sure. Um, you know, and, and uh, that's part of life. We're not penguins and we're not, and we're, and we're growing as humans till the end. And then our fingernails and hair keeps growing. And for another universe. So the evolution of my sobriety came. I was in, I was like really hell in a hand basket there during COVID really sent for a loop. I had a series of things that went on that were just unbelievably daunting to me. It became with the whole, and I'm not alone. I'm not alone. No, you're I'm definitely not, man. One of millions of, one of hundreds of millions, or billions that were affected. We've all been affected. We all have PTSD and we all have issues that we're still working with. And um, hmm. I break myself into a whirlwind of the fuck and I was using cocaine and other fucked up drugs. I've never been a I've never been a downer, Debbie Downer type guy, so I never got into the heroin or, or opioid addictions or anything like that. But um but the cocaine nightmare is real. Um I I uh, I found myself in losing my love for myself and others and during the end, towards the end of COVID in 2021 on January. In the early January, over the holiday of Thanksgiving, I realized that I really did have a problem because I was just in it so severely and I was just, I wasn't, I didn't have a lack of sobriety around and I was completely dysfunctional. And had fallen prey to my abusive behaviors, and and um, I, I I needed help, and uh, I realized that I, I hit a rock bottom, and I, I didn't really care if I lived or died. And I woke up one day just crying that I just was I just didn't know what to do, and I mm -hmm. reached to a couple for people, I, and I heard of a couple different programs in Atlanta, around Atlanta, and I. Started gathering information on how to check in, and I couldn't really afford to do anything expensive. And my insurance would only cover like a state program that was I wasn't willing to go to because I don't yeah. want to be handled. I don't want to be institutionalized. I need to be dealt with softly, or else I would just I would I my punk rock ass and then the fuck it all. Yeah, man. And, you know I don't I, I would, but I was ready for a change, but I didn't want to change it. They, I didn't want to get negative, so I tried to be positive, and I'll be damned. I, I got myself checked into a premium program. My family surrounded me. My friends surrounded me. They supported me. I just didn't make that choice, and I went and checked myself in, and I, I, I did it under my own accord. I asked for it. I, I wasn't told that I wasn't incarcerated. I didn't, wasn't in jail. I wasn't, it wasn't like that. It was like I saw myself disappearing from myself and from everyone. And I was dying. I, I was really in a death that I can hear the personal responsibility that you've taken for where you found yourself and how you've handled it. That's one of the things that is jumping out the most clearly from what you've told so far is like the way you talk about it and reflect upon it is it, you're definitely dealing with the real impact of what's going on and taking responsibility for that. And it's inspiring to me. It, it, I brought it. It's me. I, it's me. Yeah, I don't have anybody to blame. I can't blame anybody for my actions. We are responsible for ourselves and what we choose ourselves and how we choose to portray ourselves and how we the actions that we choose to do are no one else's fault but our own. And I had to own that. It's taken me. It's taken me two years. It's taken me two years and seven months. To come to, I mean, I'm in a new reality that I haven't been in before, and uh, it, every month. There's a new reality that opens up another sense of healing. And I was ready. I love life and I love people. And I got lost. I just got lost. I was really lost. I was, uh, and I was struggling with it. Too. I lost my heart. When you say you so love life and you love people, you mean you just say that you had lost that love for life and lost that love for people. I know what you mean, man, because when it was like rock bottom for me, I was alienating myself too and like isolating myself. and. Wanting connection, 
but being the reason why it wasn't happening. And yeah, it's easy to pave over your emotional distress here on, and what's caused the, the real mode of the problem is due to there's something in there that's clicking that you're unhappy self and one of the ways to, that it, to not realize or it's easy to just keep paving over your issue without addressing your issues it's just getting through the first stage of sobriety and feeling better without the substances is the first that was the first realization is that i feel so much better without this in my system but the problems i had emotionally didn't go anywhere but they were still there. Yeah, and, man. I yeah, and yeah. and you didn't have your med you didn't have your medicine no more. If you're like me, and man, it fucking hurt there for a while while you're sitting there staring at some of the mo more emotional issues without any way to run away from it. My recovery has been a very big experiment of replacing urges, cravings with other things, and that's the thing that's worked. And, and I've used AA. I've, I've participated in AA on an almost a daily basis. I, I'm AA light. Yeah. I also use a, a program that's called at smartrecovery.org. And it's more of a cognitive behavioral therapy programming. It's a reprogramming and a, a, a more of a scientific method that's very factual and very, they have very clear on how to to redirect your urges and cravings and feelings of, of, of anxiety and how to talk about that and how to, universal acceptance, universal self-acceptance, universal acceptance of others and being able to not hold on to these things that drive us into our own insanity because inside what had happened to me during my worst moments was I fell out of love with myself and didn't care about myself. And therefore I could not care for others. Yeah. And, and it was just that it was a whirlwind. It was a definitely a downtrod energy. And I, and, and I, and I'm, and that people know me, they're like, what happened? You were what? You did what? Yeah, I never saw that. I didn't. I don't know what you're talking about. You've always been such a really, yeah. We don't know what's inside another person. Yeah, man, we you don't, don't know, know what's it. inside me. Don't compare your insides to other people's outsides. What it looks like to everybody on the outside isn't really what's going on on the inside. So many times, yeah. and when you're a professional barrier that's highly functioning addict and highly functioning alcoholic and can pull off anything, what seems anything with ease. It looks like that to other people, but it's not easy, and it's a, and it's a, and it's a nightmare, and it's a place that it's filled with self doubt and insecurity, and um, yeah, man, self care. I just want to say that the first thing that I started doing was just taking just trying to take care of myself again because without me taking care of myself then it's really hard for me to be there for anyone else and i have two kids and 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 i have friends that i love and care for i have a family got my my big family in the large i have my my family of choice yeah I have, that i love and care for i love friends and it was so hard on because i didn't love myself and i did i, I couldn't I could communicate on the party level in the party and pull off my engagements and my exhibitions and all this stuff without fail, but I wasn't happy. And it wasn't anything anyone else did. It was what was going on inside of me because I was tied up in a, and I was in pain. I, I had back problems and I had this, I lost the use of my arm. And no, yeah, I remember. Anymore. Yeah. I, I, I've been through. I, as a sculptor who is self sufficient, lost the use of my left arm, and I only have 40% of that use back. Yeah. That drove, that took me down the rabbit hole in 2015. And I, you know, I, 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 re, I, I, I couldn't, I could I had to give up my Burning Man grant. That, it, I guess it's 2017 was when I, I re, I, I, I 
I gave my grant back to Burning Man and I said, I can't do this. I have a physical problem. Please redirect his finances to someone else. And I would love to do this project down the line. Yeah. You could be the chance. And that's when you met me. Was there, you, you had met before that happened. Yeah. And Kachobi and stuff. Through the, through the culture house engaged with Okeechobee on oh, that wonderful thing that was happening. Mm-hmm. What a great book. Yeah. And, and then Burning Man gave me the chance. I asked, I rewrote my proposal for 2018 because I had gotten things back in order. And I built myself a steam back up. I lost myself for a little there for a year and a half. I was in a real self now dilemma where I was depressed. Yeah. And I couldn't believe I wasn't the strong. I wasn't the person I was on the thing I wanted to do. And I was eight. I was in a medical merry go round, not being diagnosed. I had, there was a couple of diagnoses that were terminal that were misdiagnoses. I thought I was going to die for a while yeah i I remember and i just i really fucking thought of i and and that was and then pandemic and that's what even led me into asking you about this stuff is because you're talking about the future and what's next charlie and i see the health and vibrancy on you and i'm like this is a different man than he was in 2008 2019 that feeling that you had that there might be something legit wrong and might be dying rubbed off on some of your friends too I was worried. I was legit worried. And and I'm not anymore. I can see that you've got more tricks up your sleeve and there's going to be more uh, collaborations here together and stuff and and taking it to a whole new level in some ways. The brain's an interesting thing when you're trying to get sober. It tells you, oh, you might not be fun anymore. You might not fit in these communities anymore. You might not enjoy these things. But I went to a Burning Man regional sober three months ago. It was one of the best events I've ever been a part of. It was epic. I'm still a lot of fun. And you don't have to be fucked up to have a good time. But that's the thing. It's like, it doesn't require drinking and drugging to be who you really are because they're the real you is already always there. And that's the person that is the, the party time is, is an exercise of, that's needed on a lot of levels, but it, it swallows you up quick and it chomps you down quite a bit without even, you don't even know you're going. Yeah. It's just, kind of, oh, I'm going to think, do this stuff. My consistent drive in my art productions is done with so. I mean, it's in my, in my handwork, you know, like, you know, whenever, if, if I do a workshop, it's in my procedures. Like if you're going to do my workshop, you sign a contract with me that says we're not doing drugs and alcohol and smoking pot during this session. There's a time and a place for everything, and it's not in a workshop. That's for later. We can celebrate when we're done. We can celebrate after we're out of the danger zone. And that's how I run my, I try to run my exhibits that way. But of course, there's going to be some folly in there at times. Uh, There's always, uh, that's why you have to have extra people. Yeah. That are not falling in over, you know, because yeah. there's always be someone that thinks they've got it together. They're fatigued and they have one drink or two drinks and they're not in their work list or they didn't know that they need to be somewhere and they overdid their uh, their drugs and that they're too high to ride the ride. And that, that you go stand over there and just hold this shovel. I know. You know bro. I haven't experienced no, much like that to thank probably for the genesis of our friendship because I got to operate that fleebler flobbler there where for a couple nights in a row, man. I think I almost gave up my career as a photographer and became a carny at that point. Maybe I did. I don't know. The fleebler flobbler is an amazing machine and it's a, it's a cynical, it's a satirical old character about the American clowns that we have in this place. And it's a timeless piece. It really is a timeless effort. And that, that's one of the things that I love about my work is that it doesn't go away. It just evolves. Yeah. And the P that's building things out of steel and having them hold fire or spell fire, whether it's a plant effects setup or a wood burning setup. I do love my wood burners more than I do love my flame effects. 
but Planet Knicks are sometimes needed in big shows because it's just too dangerous to have sparks flying through a crowd of, of 9,000. I tell people about the red hot cock and the two and a half cords of wood it takes took to fill that fucker up and the way we were all crawling on in there to get it all stuffed up on the inside and the way folks were bringing us meat donations and we were throwing it up in the ass of the cock up through the poop chute there and spilling it out in the morning to feed the masses and that was a time, man. What we build next, Uncle Charlie? Um, right now, I'm doing a series of workshops or, uh, with a, a couple of youngsters, and we're getting ready to build a piece that's called the Solar Scope, and and it's a a mechanical device that's going to put onto the property for a private investor up in near Knoxville, Tennessee. And it's attached into the limestone core of a big giant dome. Whoa. And uh, it's going to be, it's a mechanical tool that will be tuned. It's being built. I'm working with one of my cousins who's a math artist. And she does really technical mathematic equations and can figure out every little angle and all this stuff. And so we're combining forces over the next couple of months on that. And she'll be coming down and spending a couple of weeks here with me when we get to that stage. I'm building, the, I've designed the structure and it's a homage to some ancient, it's the ancient, ancient, some of the ancient Egyptian gods and Sumerian gods. And the harnessing of time through symbolic effigy, and it'll be, it's being set in a 60 degree parallel so we can have our equinoxes and our solstices mark in the circle around it for time. Yeah. And so that they're going to be doing a, it's a time deeper and it's a, a homage to giant land art structures and old uh i guess observatories of primitive kind you know and mm -hmm. i'm using mm -hmm. some symbols the structure and then it has my charlie smith patchwork special with multi-materials there's copper and brass and glass and Staying with steel and carbon steel all meeting each other and be in different ways going up into space and then mechanism and symbols that will be grabbing different planetary arrangements and the focus of the sun through the center with the dial and it's again it's pretty cool piece fuck um, yeah charlie hey we have less than a minute left on this thing i didn't want to cut you off while you were like giving us that was like my favorite part of this whole chat so far. Maybe I love you, dude. And uh, I'll be in touch after this thing shuts off, but uh, thanks for hanging out with me. Thanks for being there when I needed you this winter. And uh, yeah. thanks for just swooping me. I'm here for you, and I'm here for whoever needs me. I'm available for the passageway into the next. Believe it. I'm here. Believe I'm it, present. man. <laughs> it's a great place to be on see you on the other side Charlie